Yeah. Um, I'd like to kneel. And I'd like to invite you to join me. And I'd like to have just a few minutes of silent prayer. Amen. And we should all just, you know, this is the Lord's day. And at this moment, this is the Lord's house. We got showers of blessings outside. Amen. We got showers of blessings inside. What do you say? Amen. So I invite you to pray with me and then I'll break the silence with the Father in heaven, we are thankful, Lord, for your Sabbath day. We're thankful for the showers of blessings outside. We ask that you would pour out your spirit here on the inside. And Lord, I need your help. I ask that Jesus only would be seen today. Help us, Lord, as we open your word. As we enter this study, Lord, somebody needs it. And I ask that, that your word, as you promised, would not return unto you, Lord. And that today we would have the testimony that our hearts burn within us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Coming of 
Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Okay? The name Seventh-day Adventist carries the true features of our faith in front and will convict the inquiring mind like an arrow from the Lord's quiver. It will bring the transgressors of God's law and will lead to repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the way, was a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> Amen. So when will the end come? Because we are Adventists and we're looking forward to Jesus coming. We're looking forward to an end of sin and suffering and all these things. When will that happen? Jesus told us, surely I come. Are we seeing things changing in our day and age? Absolutely. Revelation 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached where? In all the world. It has to go out for a witness. witness. What does witness mean? Yeah, it's, it's, it's something, it's your experience, right? If I witness a car accident, I can only share what I saw and heard. I can't share what I did not witness. Right? So the gospel has to go out for a witness, which means there has to be an experience attached to it. And then, after it's gone out to all the nations, and then shall the end come. Now, has the gospel gone to the entire world yet? We're getting there. By God's grace, we're getting there. But has, has, it, has that work been completed? Well, perhaps that means we need more people having experiences first. Amen. What is the end time message? Now, you all know this one, right? Revelation 14. Let, let's, let's turn there. You have your Bibles with you? I hope to use a lot of Bible today. Jonathan starts talking about losing power for three days. I started thinking, Lord, the computer turns off. Got the word. We still have lights in the building. <laughs> Revelation 14, 6 and 12, we know this as what? Well. Yeah. Angel's message. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, you know this one, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the power of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the mountains of the waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she made all nations. What is that? Hold on, hold on. She made what? All, all nations. nations. So there's a message going out to all nations. A counterfeit message. The gospel of this kingdom must be preached where? All to all nations. But there is another message that's going out to all, all nations. nations. My question is, which message will they hear? Right? Which message will they hear? Yeah. Sorry, I lost my place. We'll work, we'll work sweet. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, God wants to fall the great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and it shall be, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, the prince of the land. And, the, and, and you know the rest of it, right? We have this unique message, and by the way, this is not a message of doom and gloom, it's a message of hope. But it's a very straight message. It's a very straight message because there are very serious things that are happening. And God wants us to be on the right side of this in the, in the, in the, after, uh, the aftermath of the, the rest of it, right? Question. Have all nations drunk of the wine of the wrath of Babylon's fornication yet? <laughs> they appear to be, right? It's, we're, we're now getting the eye made. Yeah. I'll show you a few quotes. I'm going to look at today and see what do we see. 
and we have to watch and see what is going on today, right? What does this mean anyway? She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. How is this done? By forcing men to accept a spurious Sabbath. Do we see that happening? It's happening. Not yet, however, can it be said that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. She has not yet made all nations do this. However, are we getting there? Right there. There are two messages going to all nations. And if the three angels' message is not preached, the world will only hear what? That's it. The Bible says, fear God. But the world says what? The Bible says the hour of judgment is here and we are held accountable. But the world says there is no accountability. Do whatever you want. Do what feels good. The Bible says worship God as the creator who made everything in six literal days and rested on the seventh. Uh, seventh day, the world says there's no creator, everything evolved and came to be spontaneously from nothing. Which I find mind-blowing because that requires a lot of faith <laughs> to believe that. Right? So there's two messages going on and my question is, which one will they hear? Which one will they hear? Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of the church with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete? So is it happening? Yes. It's happening. Is it complete yet? No, but it's close. It's close. The change is a progressive one, and the, perf the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. When do our sins reach into heaven? When the law of God is finally made void by legislation. And so... Most of you are probably watching and paying attention to the news and things that are going on in current events, and you can see that we're headed right towards. Right? I don't know exactly how it's all going to unfold, but we see it happening in our in our lifetime. So God's last message. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy, and their work is not to cease until the close of this earth's history. Revelation 18 points to the time when, as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, the church will, will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel, and the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world. And guess what? God selected you and I to do it. You and I, who are right here. And you're thinking, but I'm such a mess. i got my issues and addictions, and I have my, my faults, and I haven't had a perfect day yet. And yet, God wants to use you and take the gospel to the world. That's, that's amazing. Who's going to do it? Who is going to take the gospel to the world? Our subject this morning is... Convicts. If you go in, in uh, the Webster's Dictionary, you'll see the, the verb convict, right? It means to find or to prove to be what? Guilty. Then there's the noun, convict, right? For those of you who English is not your first language, that would be very confusing, right? Amen. But, <laughs> but convict is the action. Convict is the person. Convict is a person convicted of under sentence of a crime. Now, I won't ask any of you how many of you have been sentenced of a crime. I know that I've stood before a judge in my past. And God has been good to me. Amen. John chapter 11. Let's turn there. Who's going to take the gospel to the world? Convicts. John chapter 11. Let's find out. Who are these convicts? Sorry, John chapter 8. What did I say? Sorry, John, John chapter 8.
eight. Father, help us to see what you would have us to see in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John chapter 8. Here he goes. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, hang on. What's the problem with this so far? All right, well, if there's a woman taken in adultery, there's a saying, it takes two to tango, and I'm going to keep it right there. And when they had set her in the midst, where was he? Deuteronomy says they should both be brought forth, right? But it says here they set her in the midst. I believe it was, yeah, anyway. Well, well let's keep going. And they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us know that, that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? You think they were trying to trap Jesus? Yes. Yeah, they were. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. Jesus is so wise, though. He knows how to do the right thing in the right way at the right time to reach every heart in the room. And I think that's amazing. Here's what it says. Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, So what? He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they which heard it being, what's that word? Convicted. convicted. They which heard it being convicted by their own conscience, I say that's the Holy Spirit, Amen. went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman was standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sing sweet words from Jesus. Right? Amen. Whoever has no sin among you, cast the first stone. How many stones were cast? None. None. You know why? Because every single one had sin. The woman had a sin that was apparent. They had sin that was not apparent. The woman had a sin that everyone could see. They had sin that God could see. Right here in the heart. And Jesus looks at them and says, whoever has a sin, cast the first stone. No stones were cast. But the part that breaks my heart, by the way, is that instead of walking to Jesus, they walk away from Jesus. John 1, 29. John saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away. Jesus is the only human being to walk the planet who can actually remove sin. And they walked away from the one man who could solve their sin problems. They were convicted. You think a woman was convicted? Yeah. She was convicted. Everyone, everyone was convicted. But there was only one left. And they started with the eldest, by the way. That's right. To the last. Sometimes I see people, this is just a side note, but sometimes sometimes we, we speak hopelessly about the next generation. They say this generation, they got this, they got this, they got this, and all this technology and da 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 da. Careful. Mercy. They're going to take the gospel to the world. Yeah. God's going to use them, right? Mm -hmm. If you want the next generation to act right, 
they follow your example. Because the Bible says that they went out from the presence of Jesus, starting with the oldest to the end. That's what it says. But instead of coming to Jesus, they left him. And this, the one person who stayed, Jesus did not condemn him. John 6, 37, he that comes to me, I will in no wise what? Cast out. John 6, 40, whoever sees the Son, believes on him, has everlasting life, right? Imagine in, instead of running out of the presence of Jesus, they instead ran to Jesus. We have a different story, right? But when we come under conviction, the carnal heart, you know what it does? It likes to run, and it likes to hide. That's it. That's what we do. We hide it from our friends. We hide it from our family. We deceive ourselves into thinking we can hide it from God. We may even hide it from ourselves. Right? John chapter 6, verse 60. Here's Jesus talking about how if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. What did they say? Or what happened? They said, first of all, verse 60 says, this is a hard saying. Hard saying. Verse 66 broke my heart. It said, from that time, who knows it, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. These are people who are walking with Jesus. And when they came under conviction, instead of getting closer to Jesus, they walk away from Jesus. Why do people separate themselves? Why do we separate ourselves when we come under conviction from God? It's a human history thing, right? Adam and Eve, what did they do? They hid, and they tried to cover themselves with their own works. What's our subject again? To every, to every man, sorry, I asked the wrong question. What's the theme? Unto every man his work. Here's Adam and Eve. They sinned. They went and grabbed some fig leaves. Do you have fig trees here? Yes. You have fig bushes? Okay. How big are those leaves? I'm sure the ones in the garden meeting were bigger. Too. How much do they cover if you were to sow an apron? How many of you are willing to come here tomorrow wearing nothing but an apron? How much does an apron cover? And Adam and Eve worked hard and they put together this thing which they thought could solve their sin problem. It didn't work. It didn't work. And that's why Jesus had to give them coats of skin, right? Cover them up. Aiken. Aiken, what did he do? He took the when, when they were competent. He had an opportunity to come forward, but instead of coming forward, he. Yeah. How'd that end for him? Not well, right? Saul, King Saul, continued to separate himself from God when he came under conviction. David, when he messed up, continued to cover things up and we have this thing, Pilate, Pilate convicted about who Jesus was. So, why is it that instead of coming to Jesus, we move away? We have to learn to go against our nature, to go against our feelings. John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just. He's faithful, right? To forgive us and to cleanse us. Now, the question, is that verse true when you're doing the right thing? It's true. Is it true when you're doing the wrong thing? Yes. It's true that whatever you're doing doesn't change the Bible from being true. Yes. Amen. Right? Hebrews 4 60, we're told to come boldly. When we're under conviction, when we feel like going away from Jesus, God's word is still true. Amen. And his promises are for you and me. Amen. Right? Here's another story. Luke chapter 5. Let's turn to the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I love this story. Luke chapter 5. 
it says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were doing what? Washing. Are you with me? They're doing what? Washing. They're washing their nets, which means was this before or after they, they did their work? After. It's after. So they did their work, and, and fishermen are experts in doing what? Fishing. Fishing. That's what they do. And and, and they're, they're they're good at it, that's their livelihood. And so here's Peter, here's Simon, it says in verse 3, And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and praying him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let your nets for a draught. How do you say that word? Draught? Draught. Draught. And Simon answering and said unto him, Master, we have what? Toiled all the night. And have taken what? Nothing. Here's Peter doing his trade, the one thing he's good at, and all of his personal efforts put into that one thing that he trained for, that he's been doing, it amounted to what? Nothing. How long do we toil? All, all, all night. night. He's working all night, and what does he have to show for it? Nothing. Dirty nets. He just had to clean it at the end. <laughs> Catching nothing, right? That's it. He said, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when he had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break, and they beckoned to their partners, which were the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled how many? Both, Both the ships, so that they began to. This is amazing. It wasn't one ship, but two ships that started to sink with the influx that came right after the word of the Lord joined them, right? Prior to that, what were they doing? Sorry, the night before what were they doing? They were fishing. How much did they catch? Nothing. Because they tried in their own strength. And here's Jesus. He says, put the net down. So much fish that two ships began to sink. Now, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying what? Depart from me, for I am a what? Sinful man, O Lord. Do you think Peter came under conviction? Yes. Mm -hmm. Watch this. Peter was unmindful now of boats or lady. This miracle, above any other he had ever witnessed, was to him a manifestation of divine power. In Jesus, he saw one who held all nature under his control. And pay attention to this statement here. The presence of divinity revealed his own unholiness. Right, I'm going to say it again. The presence of Christ's divinity revealed Peter's own what? Unholiness. I'm going to say it backwards now. The absence of Jesus makes us feel holy. Okay, so In the presence of Jesus, we feel holy. We are nothing compared to him. When Christ is not in the life, you can have all the scripture memorized along. You can read the Conflict of the Ages series forward and backwards. You can wear a dress, you can eat your broccoli, you can do whatever externally looks like a Christian. But if Christ is not in the heart, all it will make you do is feel holy. Or convicted. What's that? Or convicted. Yeah. But in the presence of Christ, 
we stand convicted. Love for his master, shame for his own unbelief, gratitude for the condescension of Christ, above all, the sense of his uncleanness in the presence of infinite purity overwhelmed him. Mm. While his companions were securing the contents of the net, Peter fell down at Jesus' feet, exclaiming, This is interesting. He's grabbing onto Jesus yeah. and saying, Depart, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. That same feeling that the ones who were ready to stone the woman felt, they were under conviction. They were convicted, but instead of going to Jesus, they went where? Away, Away from Jesus because they followed their... Starts with an F. Someone said it. Who said it? They followed their feelings. And they felt unworthy. They felt their, the magnitude of their sinfulness. Went out from the presence of the Lord. But here's Peter. He felt that same thing. He's saying, depart from me. He doesn't feel worthy to be in the presence of Jesus. Yet, I love this. It was the same presence of divine holiness that had caused the prophet Daniel to fall as one dead before the angel of God. He said, my comeliness was turned into me into corruption and I retained no strength. So when Isaiah beheld the glory of the Lord, he exclaimed, woe is me for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Humanity with its weakness and sin was brought in contrast with the perfection of divinity. And he felt altogether deficient and what? Thus it has been with all who have been granted a view of God's greatness and majesty. And I don't know about you, but I want one of those today. Amen. I want to see Jesus. Amen. I want to see more of him and less of me, honestly. Amen. I'm the last one who wants to be standing up here right now. Believe me. Believe me. Peter exclaimed, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Yet he clung to the feet of Jesus, feeling that he could not be parted from him. The Savior answered, Fear not. Ah, now here it comes. Our subject is the convicts. What's our theme? To every, to every man his. Okay, here it comes. Fear not, Jesus said to Peter, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Amen. Now look at the parallel. Peter was fishing for fish, which is something he's good at, and he caught what? Nothing. Now if Peter, now Jesus is teaching Peter a lesson. If Peter goes fishing for men, Without Jesus, guess, guess what he's going to catch? No, nothing. nothing. It was after Isaiah had beheld the holiness of God and his own unworthiness that he was entrusted with the divine message. And it was after Peter had been led to, now don't miss this, it was after Peter had been led to, let's read that part, self-renunciation. What's that mean? Denying, denying, denying. Okay, denying ourselves, right? Uh, uh, letting go of our self supremacy and self righteousness. Yeah. Peter's an expert fisherman. He can say, Lord, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But he didn't, right? It was after Peter had been led to self renunciation and. After Peter, Peter had been led to dependence upon divine power, that he received the call to his work for Christ. Amen. So if you want to know what God wants you to do, if you're, if you're in this valley of decision, Lord, what do you want me to do? Believe me. I've been asking God that for most of my life. Lord, what do you want me to do? I know I'm supposed to do something. What am I supposed to do? Well, if you're at that moment where you're not sure, or you know there's something, but you're still not sure you have you received your, your specific calling or whatever it is, here's my counsel for you. Spend time in the presence of Jesus. I know that sounds overly simplistic, but it's so true. When we spend time with Jesus, and we see ourselves in contrast with him, when we let go of self-supremacy, 
self-exaltation, self-righteousness, self whatever, self hyphen whatever, right? Or dash, what do you call it? Dash, right? Whatever it is. When we get to the point where I'm like, Lord, I need you. I, I don't just want you, I need you. <laughs> I can't get through this day without you. Right? How do you get your life work? How do you get your calling? Well, God gives it to you. That's simple. Mm -hmm. God gives it to you, but not until we become convicted, renounce self, and totally depend on the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then look at this part, which goes on to say in Luke. When they had brought their ships to land, Peter and his com companions forsook all and followed Jesus. Amen. That was one of the most beautiful endings that I've heard. Thus were these humble fishermen called by the God of heaven to their life work. So, what will the work look like when the convicts cling to Jesus? Okay. The last message of mercy has been given to the, uh, uh, sorry, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Do you think Peter had experienced that day? Yes. 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 As the end approaches, the testimonies of God's servants will become more decided and more powerful. I love that this convention we're sharing testimonies. Because that's really what God wants us to do, right? As the third angel's message swells into a loud cry, great power and glory will attend its proclamation. The faces of God's people will shine with the light of heaven. Yeah. Someone should have said amen. Mm -hmm. You know what amen means? I agree. It doesn't mean I agree. It so means be. let it be so, right? The power which stirred the people so mightily in the 1844 movement will again be revealed. The third angel's message will go forth, not in whispered tones, but with a loud voice. And I saw that this message will close with power and strength far exceeding the midnight cry. And God wants to use who? Convicts. He wants to use me. He wants to use you. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of power of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former reign at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter reign at its close. Oops. Servants of God with their faces lighted up, shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. Amen. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. And signs and wonders will follow the believers. Do you see miracles today? Yes, yeah. Lou and Darlene. They've seen miracles here at Boulder Creek over the years. <laughs> yes, Jonathan and Hannah, you've seen miracles happen here. God is working. Yeah. But He wants to give us a greater experience. Yeah. A greater experience. greatest want of the world, you know this one, is the want of those men and women who will not be bought or those who in their inmost souls are true and honest, those who do not fear to call sin by its right name, those whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, those who will stand for the right, though what? Will you join this movement? Will you look to Jesus and see him in contrast with yourself? Will you allow yourself to be convicted of your sins and run to Jesus in response? If so, then you will be entrusted with the most heroic duty ever given to man in these last days. To stand for the right, to warn the world, to win souls for Jesus and cause the second coming. Yeah. So are you a convict? Are you convicted? Are you convinced and convicted of all that is truth 
that is laid out before you? Are you following all the light you have been convicted of? It's a real question. I'm going to ask it again. Don't answer. Just think. Are you following? I didn't say, did you read it? Are you what? Following all the light you have been convicted of or is there? Do you see yourself in contrast to Christ's perfect example? And if so, you have two directions you can go. You can follow the people who drop the stones, or you can run to the feet of Jesus. That's what God wants for us. Alright. Our responsibility and accountability are in proportion to the light that we have had, in proportion to the privileges and opportunities that have been given us. The Lord requires far greater what? Personal effort. Personal effort. Right? Um, the Lord requires that far greater personal effort shall be put forth by the members of our churches. Souls have been neglected. Towns and villages are, and, and cities have not heard the truth for this time because wise missionary efforts have not been made. Religion and vice prevail on every hand. Most earnest work must be done to come close to, to, come close to souls. This time, meaning the time that we're in now, this time demands that advanced moves be made, that resolute, persevering faith be exercised, that a patient, self-denying, long-suffering spirit be manifest by every, every member of our churches, and that each who profess the fall of Christ shall become a worker in his moral vineyard. Is God have work for you to do? Yes. Work, he has work for me to do. The God-fearing members of the church can do more good by devoted, personal effort that our ministers can accomplish when they feel no burden to labor from house to house. Our ordained ministers must do what they can, but it must not be expected that one man can do the work of all. The master has appointed unto every man his work. There are visits to be made. There's praying to be done. There's sympathy to be imparted. And the piety, the heart and hand of the whole church is to be employed if the work is to be accomplished. Mm. You can sit down with your friends and in a pleasant, social way, talk of the precious Bible faith. Mm. Not just with your Adventist friends. Mm -hmm. Mm. Right? It's okay to go out and talk to people. You know, the world is, is, is really thirsting after the truth that we have. Mm. More than they realize it, more than we realize it. I, I think of the prodigal son, and Jesus tells this parable. The young man demands his inheritance, and then he goes where? Out. He goes away from his father, goes out of the world, and it says not many days he squandered how much? Aww. All of it. And he ended up in the pig pen, eating pig filth, whatever they eat. I don't know what pigs eat. And then it, the Bible says he came to himself. And he said, I will arise and go where? This young man went and he experienced the world. And after experiencing the world, what he did not want is more of the world. He's looking for the Father. How did he know to go back to the Father? Who moved? The father never moved. And he knew he could go back to his father. Amen. Amen. And that's what the world is looking for. I know we think that they, they look for secularism. It's true. Secularism draws at the flesh. We're all drawn to that. Whether we think we are or not, we're all drawn to it. The carnal heart is drawn to secularism. But when we're done with that, the world is thirsting for something better. You know? Who's going to give it to them? 
All right, just reading the highlighted part. All who profess to believe that the Lord is soon coming should reveal their what? Faith. Faith by corresponding words. Course. Now, I'm going to touch on this and then we'll, we'll bring it to a close here. Is there a difference between works and work. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna phrase it a little different, but I, I, I didn't do that right. Is there a difference between our works and our work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There is. There is. Right. Let, let's look at some examples, a couple of examples, and then um, of people who, who were convicted. They had this personal experience with Jesus. And then notice what was the result. John chapter 4. We turn with me there. All right, what book? John, what chapter? Four. four. Here we go. John chapter 4. Here's a woman at the well. And Jesus just exposed her. Isn't that right? Not to everyone. He exposed her to, to her, right? And... and Verse 28 says, The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man which told me all things I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Did she have an experience with Jesus? Yes. You think she felt convicted? Yes. She did. And look at the result. The result was she went out. All right. Jesus exposed her works and then gave her her work. Right? She went out and what happened? She told, she told everyone, right? <laughs> and then we get to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city, what? <laughs> Believed on him for the saying of the woman, which did what? So the teeth. Testify, which means she had to tell her her experience. Yes. They believed because of her testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many... More believe because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying. For we have heard him what? Ourselves. And know that this indeed is Christ, the Savior of the world. Here's this woman under conviction. She's exposed before Christ. Did she walk away? Or do you think she embraced what Christ was offering her? Well, she embraced it and she ran with it. And people came, right? They did. Mark chapter 5, there's another one. Again, I won't read the whole thing, but Matthew and Mark chapter 5. Here's a man who had a different problem. He opened his mouth and the voice came out saying, who remembers? My name is Legion. Legion, for we are men. And the Lord healed him. Isn't that right? The Lord healed him. And verse 15, they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were, do you think that guy had a testimony? Yes. Have an experience with Jesus? And then he wanted to come with Jesus everywhere, right? I think of Peter. Peter they, they forsook all and followed him. So now here's the demoniac. I hate that we call him that. I wish we had a better name for him. But it says here in verse 17, they began to, to pray him to depart out of their out of the coast of people, right? Because of their swine thing. Their swine flu, right? <laughs> verse 18, and when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil, prayed him that he might be with him. Albeit Jesus suffered him not, but said to him, Go home. Here he is. He's giving this man his Go home to thy friends and tell them 
your testimony. Tell them how great things the Lord has done for you. Friends, we don't have a gospel message unless it first touches me. Right? We don't and, and we don't have anything to share with the world unless this message first converts my heart. Unless I first see myself in contrast with Jesus until I'm broken. What else are we sharing? Right. So he sends them out. And I can't wait to see how many will be in the kingdom of God because of that man. Amen. Can't wait to hear his real name too, by the way. <laughs> He's going to have a new one. First John 1, 1 through 4, we know this one. First John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have what? Handled of the... Did John have an experience with Jesus? He rested on his chest, right? For the life was manifested, we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested unto us, that which we have, what? Seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, Jesus Christ. These things write rightly unto you, that your joy may be What do all these things have in common? They overcame by the blood of the... What does that mean? When you overcome by the blood of the Lamb, it means the gospel was effective for me. Amen? Amen. It was effective for me. Christ rescued me. Amen. And I owe him everything. Amen. And then we tell the world Amen. that there's hope for them too. Amen. They experienced Christ. Then they went out with power and share their experience. There's a difference between our work and our works. Uh, as my brother Ivan shared last night, Mark chapter 13, here we see that God gives every man his work. Our work is the specific task or method that God has for us through which we are to share the last message of warning. Right? He gives every man our, his work. But our works is a different thing. So our work is the task that God has given us. Are we together? Yes. Alright. Our works is not just the task, but it's our life. I'll say it this way, our lifestyle. It's what we did. It's what is written in the books. <laughs> is our works. Right? And we see throughout the Bible that our works are always spoken of in context of judgment. The judgment. And guess what? We have all come short. In that department. We've all come short. God gives us our work and he rewards us according to our works. But there's one more man who walked this planet who also had his work. Isn't that right? Yes. Jesus had his work. I'm thankful that he calls us to be co- laborers. Co -laborers. He's not just saying, okay, get this done. He's saying, I'm going to do it where? Before the foundations of the earth were laid, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. This pledge... Christ has fulfilled. When upon the cross he cried out, It is finished, he addressed the Father. The compact had been fully carried out. 
Now he declares, Father, it is finished. I have done thy will. Here's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He feels my sins crushing him. And in his humanity, did he feel like going through with that? No. No, he didn't. And he said, Father, if it's possible, that this cup should be removed. And then he looks down with his loving prophetic eyes and he sees Ashwin in 2023 and all the mess that I would be. And he says, heaven is not home without him. And heaven's not home without you. And he says, thy will be done. Right? Thy will be done. I have done thy will, oh my God. I have completed the work of redemption if thy justice is satisfied, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Jesus' work was to pay the penalty of my works and offer me his works instead. All right, I know it's hot here. I'm going to say it again. I want you to think about this. Jesus' work was to pay the penalty of my works. So my works are what? Sinful. In other words, he, 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 he died on the cross as if he had my sinful works as his record. And then he gives me in exchange his life record. As if I did his works. And in the judgment, are we seen as not guilty or innocent? By faith. Yes. Everyone hesitated because we all know. I think the pardon is the we hesitate because we know our own sin, right? By faith. But by faith, by faith. innocent, why? Not because you're innocent, not because I'm innocent, but because Christ. Jesus is innocent. Right. And when yeah. I accept his life, I'm considered innocent, not because I'm innocent, but because Jesus is innocent. Amen. Amen. Right? And, and the reward to give to every man according to his works I don't get what I deserve according to my works. I get according to his works. Amen. And my prayer is that my works would line up with his works. Right? Here's the last one. Two times I've ever cried by reading a book. The first time was when I read my favorite book on the planet, the book of John. And the last few words brought tears to my eyes. And I even circled those tears, so I wanted to remember. Second time I ever, that, that a book has ever brought me to tears was when reading this book, The Desire of Asians. And, and, and maybe, I'm not expecting anyone to cry at this or anything, but it was so real for me when I read this paragraph. Right? So I just wanted to share it. Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. Amen. It is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave, not merely as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but because through faith, his life has become ours. And that moved me to tears the first time I read that because I knew the mess of my life. And I thought it's so incredible that Jesus would give me his life instead of mine. Right? Those who see Christ in his true character, receive him into the heart, have everlasting life. When does everlasting life begin? Now. Right now, right? Right now. It is through the spirit that Christ dwells in us and the Spirit of God, received into the heart by faith, is the beginning of the life eternal. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Amen. May it begin right here with us. Friends, I don't know, 
I can't answer the question, what does God want you to do? I don't know. I don't know the specifics of that. All I know is he has called us to be a part of this great final work of giving the last warning message to the world. It's a message of love. It's a message of hope. just a message. It's an experience. I want to have that experience. Amen. I'm not talking about the experience you had five years ago, ten years ago, when God first pricked your heart, when you made all these decisions, when you prayed the big prayer, I'll go where you want me to go, Lord, I'll do whatever. I prayed that prayer myself. Maybe it's been a while since you prayed that prayer. We're not looking for old experiences. I die, what? Amen. We need a new experience today. Amen. I don't just need to run with the experience of when I first saw Christ. Butler Creek, this place was so special to me. This was the place where I first asked Jesus to be my friend. Amen. And he never disappointed. Amen. But that can't be my only experience. Amen. He wants to have that experience with you today. Amen. To come into the presence of Jesus, He loves you. Amen. He knows all that you ever did. And if we remain at His feet instead of running out of His presence, Amen. not only will He give us pardon, He gives us His life as a human sin. And He gives us our life work as well. And he says, oh, and sin. How many of you, I'll just make one appeal, a couple of appeals. You have been convicted. I'm not talking about today or from this sermon or anything, but you have been convicted, maybe through your own studies, maybe through something that the Lord used someone to tell you or whatever. You've been convicted, it's very specific. You've been convicted that something needs to change. Something specific that we've been holding on to that Jesus is saying, let go, my child. There's something specific and God wants to give you a mission. He wants to give you a work, but there's something hindering us from going out with power because we still need that experience. Maybe you felt convicted, you were reading something, and you said, I need to change this about my diet, I need to change this about my dress, I need to change this about my music, I need to change this about my media uh, usage, I need to change this about my attitude, I need to change this because I'm so selfish, I need to change this because I'm prideful and arrogant, I need to change this because I'm self-righteous and I put out this thing that I'm holy. These are real things. Mm -hmm. My appeal is this. If you are under the conviction of God and you've been walking the wrong way, my appeal is to do something that you learn in marching and drilling in the military. About it's face. called what? About, About face. face. <laughs> That's simple. My appeal is this. If you've been under conviction and you've been walking the wrong way, but you're saying in your heart, Lord, I need your help to make that about face. I see there's a problem and I need your help to turn the right way and to come to you, to come to Christ with this area of my life that I've been holding back. I want to invite you to come forward. I know, I know, it's uncomfortable. I want you to come forward. And I'm, I'm forward. <laughs> There's an area that you know you've been struggling with and you need help with, you've been under conviction, I'm not necessarily saying today, but in your life somewhere, sometime, God has been pricking your heart and you know 
that God is wanting you to do this. He wants to use you, but you know that you're not you're, you're not going forward with the power you could have because you're holding back. I stand convicted. Second appeal. Lord, I'm doing the best that I know to do. But help me to do better. I'm doing the best. I, I, I believe I'm studying the word. I'm trying with all my heart. But I want to do what best pleases you, and I want to be part of this closing work. I'll invite you to stand as well. And you're not responding to me. I'm not, believe me, I'm no preacher. You're not responding to me. You don't need to stand if you didn't feel anything telling you to stand. But if the Holy Spirit is asking you to stand, you're not responding to me, you're responding to God. Right. And it's not for me or anyone to the left or to the right to see. But we want to make an adjustment in our lives because heaven's going to be sweet. Mm. We don't want to miss it. And there's nothing on this planet worth missing it for. Well, let's go to knees and have an experience.